a local reporter and I periodically reported on the VA. Know a few people, but haven't really looked at it lately. And I'm trying to get a, a little bit of focus for figuring out how to do some coronavirus related reporting. Other than just calling the people that I do know and saying, hey, anything going on, what are some issues that are likely to, to be worth digging at in veterans hospitals and similar um, public health institutions? When you talk about the VA, the first important thing to know is that the VA is actually three agencies. The first is the healthcare system. So that's what we've been talking about. Yep. And so there are about 170 hospital systems and then many, many more than that clinics associated with each of these hospital systems. Um, so, uh, so for example, I'm talking to you from San Francisco. In Northern California, we have about four of these hospital systems in San Francisco, Palo Alto, Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Um, then down in LA, there's a few, and 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 so you have one in New Haven. So, um, and and then all of the issues that you and I have been discussing are operative, right? Mm -hmm. Do they have enough masks and gloves? Do they even have the ability to process COVID-19 tests? There was an Inspector General's mm -hmm. report that came out late last week that said in the entire country, the only hospital that could process it, uh, these tests was in Palo Alto, California. Um, and so asking like, well, have they improved on that? Uh, do they have enough medicines on hand? The Inspector General's report also said that many hospitals did not necessarily have enough medicine. And, um, and, and, and so the, all the basic questions that you would want to know about any hospital system, asking them about this one uh, is, is very important. And you, um, and you can see, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the percentage of veterans who uh, I'm sorry you can see um, uh, I'm sorry I just lost my train of thought because I saw that Jasper Craven who's a great reporter posted on our thread about the uh, the vacancy rates for local hospitals yeah. so one of the great things about the VA is that um, is that there's a lot of information readily available for reporters now. Uh, when I first started reporting on the VA, um, they had like a don't look, don't find policy. They would never make anything public so you couldn't find any problems. Um, and that was during the President Bush era. And I'd say over the intervening years, there's been a number of transparency uh, 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 acts. So what Jasper just pointed in was something that has been made public thanks to the, the VA Mission Act. Um, so I said, and we report in our story that there are 44,000 vacancies. Well, you can actually go into, you can click on that link and it will tell you how many empty positions there are at your hospital um, and by classification. So how many nurses, how many doctors, um, how many janitors, you know, et cetera. And that's going to be useful. Um, so, so another crucial lesson here is, if you are a local reporter or a, on a kind of narrow beat, really n spend a little while educating yourself about available data and figure out how to localize it. That's really kind of a crucial part in figuring out what questions to ask. Let me ask you a similar sort of exercise on housing, on, on your other beat, because I think this is a, a tough one. Very often local business reporters or political reporters or real estate reporters will know their local scene over here, and then you've got national affairs reporters covering the Fed, covering Treasury, covering these big policies up here. What we're going to be seeing in the economy over the next months as a result of Corona-19 is the very local expression of these big national policies and conflicted interests and the, the watchdog who was fired today, watchdogs who didn't bark, whatever it is that, that we're gonna get. Methodologically, if a local or regional reporter is trying to get some purchase on this housing story, the finance and real estate at a more statewide or local level, what are, what's some good methodology there? Well, the one good news that we have on the, on the housing stuff is that we literally saw this movie 10 years ago. 
right? <laughs> so, so we have, we are in a much better position now to cover this than we were in 2008 because we have the benefit of 2008. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for us, all the screwed up things that were underneath the surface in 2008 um, are about to become highly relevant again. So let me give you an example. Um, I have a story coming out next week, which is about the mortgage relief efforts mm -hmm. that they uh, that the Trump administration has put out. This is actually uh, much better than anything Bush or Obama did. Mm -hmm. They have they're offering three months of forbearance to anyone with an FHA uh, FHFA, so Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac mortgage. So basically, if the government those are, is and for, for those of you who are not housing reporters on this call, that's a federally subsidized mortgage in the U.S. Well, no, not yeah. only a federally subsidized mortgage, but even if the federal government is any way involved in your mortgage. Yeah. So if you have a mortgage from the Veterans Administration or from the Federal Housing Administration, your mortgage is being directly subsidized. Fannie yeah. Mae or Freddie Mac are these big companies that were chartered by Congress, you know, 80 years ago with Fannie Mae under Roosevelt, they own a lot of mortgages. They're regulated by the government. So if the government is somehow involved, then they, they can't foreclose on you. They're supposed to uh, allow you to not make your payments for a few months if you're impacted by the coronavirus, um, uh, et cetera. But, and if you're a tenant living in a building owned by somebody who has one of these loans, then mm -hmm. you're supposed to get forbearance. So what this means is that everyone is about to have to find out who owns their mortgage, uh -huh. right? So, so that's what I'm saying about we've seen this movie before. Like, think about all those stories that you read or you reported or you heard in 2008, 9, 10. They're all about to be relevant again. So I felt like I was actually just before this call, I was on the phone with Wells Fargo because I was talking to this homeowner in California who has a loan with Wells Fargo and um, and uh, uh, like, who owns her mortgage? So we went on the phone, because who owns her mortgage is gonna determine whether or not she can get relief. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I showed her like, this is the lookup for Fannie Mae. No, you don't have a Fannie Mae mortgage. This is a lookup for Freddie Mac. Oh, you don't have a Freddie Mac mortgage. Then the next guidance is call Wells Fargo. So she calls Wells Fargo. She's like doing the phone tree thing for over an hour with Wells Fargo and then gave up. So then I emailed Wells Fargo myself and I said, I'm, I'm inquiring as a journalist on behalf of Ms. Perez. And they said, oh, well, we'll give Ms. Perez a call. Um, <laughs> so that's, you know, like you're laughing because it's like a bad dream. It's like we all lived yeah. through this not that long ago. So these things are gonna become important again. And the point of the story that you put at the top of the thread about the, um, about the business uh, yeah. story, I'll be the oversight, is that just like 2008, the banks, the banks have a lot of money right now. The FDIC mm -hmm. reports that banks collectively made $233 billion last year. Um, so they made half a trillion dollars over the last two years. And the Fed is actually buying up securities and other things to push liquidity into the banking sector. Mm -hmm. but, but if you're the homeowner, you're supposed to be getting this temporary relief, but then what's gonna happen next? So we'll, we'll start going to questions. You should start um, sending in your questions for Aaron um, via chat. One of the things about, let me ask one other thing before we, we kind of go to the questions. Um, one thing about investigative reporting is that it tends to be more, it's strategic. We're working on a longer arc. You, you are seeing one hopes to see where the story is going. Yet here, there we all feel this enormous fog of uncertainty. We don't know how long the 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 containment is going to last. We don't know how long the pandemic will stretch out, or whether there'll be a second cycle, or when things will come back to normal. How's uncertainty affected your investigative strategy? Um, well, all those issues that you uh, mentioned are real. Um, on the other hand, uh, we know that it's bad, right? Mm -hmm. We know that it is really, really, really bad. And, um, and that eventually, um, 
these are things that we're going to have to reckon with. So what I'm doing is leaning into what I know about when things get bad. And so as I try to imagine, like, what am I going to chase now that's going to be relevant? So I'm not doing a two month investigation or a six month investigation. Mm -hmm. I'm doing like a story a week, two stories a right. week, right. you know, but I'm thinking about that time horizon, right? Okay. I'm thinking about getting in a lane and making a difference. And so, um, for example, somebody already put into this, the thread here, are deferred mortgage payments due at the end of the loan as a balloon payment? Will this information be front and center? Right, that is an excellent question to be mm -hmm. asking right now. And the answer that the government says is, it's not supposed to happen. You're not supposed to get a balloon payment, but people don't really believe that, right? Mm -hmm. And where's the teeth? And so all of these, we can see, right? We can see that already 10 million people have filed for unemployment and that they're being told they don't need to pay their mortgage now. And we know that someone is going to have to pay, right? Is it going to be the banks? Is it going to be people who have been out of work? Is it going to be the taxpayers? So we can see into the future here. So we can both be asking the questions about now and also be asking the questions about the future. And the same thing you know, for uh, the VA healthcare system, right? We have to report on the situation now, but, uh, you know, I just got back from the VA and, and I'll send it out to the group um, when we post. There have already been, uh, in addition to the veterans who are sick, there are almost 800 staff that are sick with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got a breakdown by hospital. So that should be able to help local reporters on the call. We'll post that later today. Um, but, uh, you know, we need to, it's not unreasonable. We have a, the, another part of the VA is the benefit system for people disabled by war. You know, let's talk, we're going to need some kind of benefit system for all of the people who are disabled by COVID-19, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so we can imagine what are going to be the stories that are going to be generated six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. We can we can imagine them now and decides which ones are we going to try to pick off. Okay. Um, you know, we know that the National Guard and Reserve were mobilized uh, uh, to send people to Iraq, right? And we know all the issues that happened when those guardsmen came home and the way that they were not treated the same as their active duty brethren. Yeah. Guess who's being mobilized right now? Yeah. The National Guard. So, you know, like, these are all questions that we can be asking now because we have the benefit of the recent past. Right. So again, two crucial, uh, two crucial lessons. Get in a lane and make a difference and ask about now, but also ask about the future and imagine, use your imagination to think about where these issues are going to express themselves. Um, this is a good time if folks want to chat in questions. Um, if not, I will keep going, but I would encourage everyone to do so. Um, uh, and just to add, Paul, uh, Paul Sullivan, who's a veterans advocate who's on this call, also has just chatted in, Guard and Reserve Service members deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan wars were three to four times more likely to have their VA disability claim denied, mainly due to lost military records. But will the same thing happen this time? If not, why not? It's never too early to start asking questions. Let me go back to, to this yeah, question. Yeah, I just say, like, this issue of claims, you know, is obviously... Uh, people like me and Paul who have learned a lot from war, you know, it's not too early to start asking like, what's like, I'm not investigating workers comp, right? Mm -hmm. But just imagine what's going to have to our workers comp system, because I'll tell you the VA employees who can't work because they're sick, they're all being told to go on workers comp. That's happening all over this country. Our workers comp is about to be bankrupt. And people are going to be asked to prove are you really sick from COVID-19? And all the kind of stories that Paul and I are familiar with about veterans coming home from war, having their PTSD claim denied, yeah. it's gonna be an issue for workers of all types all across this country. Um, there's uh, Sue Kaplan, who's a, another past Art Center fellow who also is preparing some tip sheets on this and our other calls, um, asks uh, Paul to chime in, but I'll ask Aaron, you and Paul, if you can unmute yourself, um, you know, she adds that Iraq and Afghan veterans have been less likely than some of their um, than previous generations to use the VA. Is is that likely to change? And Paul, well, you've answered it on chat. But why don't you answer it anyway? Or I'll go, go ahead, Paul. 
find out. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we're fine. Go. Um, younger veterans are actually far more likely to use VA hospitals than older veterans. Mm -hmm. Vietnam veterans used VA healthcare at a rate of about 20% until the Agent Orange laws changed in 2010, and then it went up to about 30%. Mm -hmm. The first year of the Gulf War was about 30% healthcare use. Now Iraq and Afghanistan are at 50 and 60% healthcare use. Wow. So um, the VA has actually done a far better job reaching out to and treating veterans. There's issues about timeliness and claims. Mm -hmm. We get all that, but far more veterans have flooded into VA. And, and, and we should say, we should say just because um, I may have not made it, completely clear at the top of the hour that these VA issues are so central because you're talking about a population that is rife with risk factors, that is both older, that in often cases is physically vulnerable, um, and in many cases are smokers. It's, a, it's the coronavirus trifecta. Um, Jasper asks a really interesting question, Aaron, which is about the use of Pending the use of Freedom of Information Act stuff. Have you had any experience with FOIA slowdown or any other thing since the coronavirus began, crisis began, or is it too soon to know? Um, well, I, I'll just be honest. I have not filed a FOIA um, mm -hmm. since the coronavirus began. I've just basically decided that I'm just going to try to get what I can by having people give stuff to me. I find that right now, as I said at the outset, people are like more willing to give me stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I have like, if I have to wait a month, I'm not sure that it's relevant. And also I'm not actually sure if the document that I'm asking about has been created yet. Um, <laughs> uh, like, I, I, so I have like, a, but I have been starting to think about uh, this. Another uh, journalist says, are uh, other reporters that reveal having luck in getting their FOIAs replied? I would say that we've seen a real slowdown. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although our attorney is telling me the courts are open. Mm -hmm. um, although I can say that I have a FOIA that is out where we're in litigation that has to do with shell company purchases of residential real estate. Mm -hmm. And it's been postponed, right? The, mm -hmm. like, so we're in litigation and I, we were about to make some progress, I think, and now we have to wait, you know, in the pandemic. Yes. Uh, but uh, I, there's, there's also, you know, it's important, I always think about FOIA, it's important to ask like, who are all the people who have the thing? And, um, I was pretty amazed. A former colleague of mine, uh, Christina Jewett, who used to be at Reveal and is now at Kaiser Health News, did a great story about all these emails uh, that federal officials were sending around showing that what they knew way more than they were telling us back in February, including the VA, HHS, et cetera. And she got it all by filing a Public Records Act request in Washington state under mm -hmm. the Washington state open records. So, so using your state open record laws is going to be crucial for any of these public agency related. Yeah. Issues. And also Christina is actually in California, but she, she understood that the epidemic first came to us in Seattle area. Right. Mm -hmm. And so she's filing these FOIAs with the Trump administration. We all know that the Trump administration is not a huge, excited about open flow of information. So <laughs> she thought, oh, well, these people in Washington state, they probably were talking about it too. Maybe they were talking with Washington, mm -hmm. uh, DC. So she FOIA'd in Washington state and she wrote a really excellent story. So I would, I would recommend thinking about all of the potential places you could FOIA, but not only the most logical place. Talking about um, housing, and veterans in the same conversation inevitably means that there's, there's an intersecting Venn diagram around homelessness. And, you know, clearly you can, A, as Mary Reese writes in, many veterans of all wars are homeless. And B, any uptick in evictions or in uh, mortgage foreclosures puts downward pressure on, on the, the homelessness situation and you kind of start to see more people. Um, 
And that's actually a good place for local or regional reporters to grab hold of the issue, because certainly I know here in New Haven, for example, how homelessness issues are very visible and very much alive. There are a lot of people on the street, the city is trying to house them. If you were trying to look for indicators of, of, of getting a hold on the homelessness story during this pandemic, using your, your two areas of specialty, what, how would you do it? What would be some places to look? Well, I mean, one important thing to think about in terms of veterans and homelessness is that the government has actually done a pretty good job over the last 10 years or so. I mean, mm -hmm. President Obama, when he came into office, he pledged to end veteran homelessness. Mm -hmm. And that did not happen. But the VA actually, amidst all of its failures, it made tremendous pro progress and dramatically reducing the number of homeless people. And it basically did it by giving people um, a housing voucher, mm -hmm. like get them cut, cut to the front of the line for a housing voucher and a social worker uh, to make sure that they had care. And it's amazing like how fast you can solve homelessness when you give people housing, right. um, you know? And, uh, and so I think that uh, local officials though, you know, obviously are having less success than the federal government did yeah. um, with veterans. And so I, that's the thing that I always mention when this issue of veterans and homelessness are brought up together is that it's actually an area where the VA has a lot of, has had a lot of success and finding the people in the VA who are responsible for that success and, um, and getting it out there is, uh, it, you know, taking advantage of that expertise during a time of crisis can be useful. Um, I also want to say about the VA that uh, when you talk about the, increasing level of insecurity that people are facing. Um, uh, not only homelessness, but you know, already 10 million Americans have filed for unemployment. Mm -hmm. That means that they are losing their health insurance. Um, we have employer-based health insurance for most people in this country. And so if you lose your uh, employer-based health insurance and you're a veteran, you might have been using Kaiser or, or Blue Shield or something else before, mm -hmm. but now you're gonna go take advantage of those VA benefits. And so typically in an economic downturn, which is where we're headed, the number of people trying to use the VA goes up uh, at the same time that the VA may or may not have the resources to handle that. And are those numbers tracked locally? Is there a way that we can localize that, that issue? Um, you know, the VA should be able to provide you like annual or quarterly data on number of patients. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can definitely look at veteran. I think there's some veterans unemployment statistics maybe uh, that you can get through EDD uh, in your state or from the Department of Labor. Um, and then you can try to triangulate that with the local VA. But I think just, uh, it's just a good thing to keep in mind, you know. Um, uh, as we move forward and to watch for. Um, mm -hmm. And you might get a lot of success with like uh, uh, veteran service organizations like mm -hmm. the American Legion and others who kind of places veterans will go to if they're in crisis and ask them what they're seeing. Uh, that's another thing that I would do. Are VA uh, ventilators and ICUs included in the sort of statewide census that many governors are doing? You know, I actually don't know the answer to that. That's a very good question. Um, and I have asked uh, many times uh, of the VA how many ventilators they have, mm -hmm. um, which you think would be an answerable question. And they always get back to me and say, we have enough ventilators. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, and so that would be a thing where you know, maybe it would be to my uh, advantage to file a FOIA, except for I'm just worried that by the time I get the FOIA back, whatever I get will no longer be usable. Well, so and, I, this, and this again on. might be, be an area where um, either local and regional reporters or other national reporters together can um, start asking these questions of their VA sources. What, what is the local census of ventilators and ICUs like? Uh, here's a, another question from Sue Kaplan. Um, and others should chime in with questions if you have them. Increases in the amount of overall domestic violence is an issue you know, nationally and indeed internationally. The World Health Organization and the, and the US, Secretary General of the UN have both warned about this um, in, in the pandemic. Without reinforcing a stereotype that is nevertheless true, 
should Veterans Administration therapists or other medical professionals be proactively reaching out to veteran families who have previous histories in this area? What, what should the VA be doing or how do we track what the VA is doing in this you know, area? The, 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 what this question raises for me is something that I've been thinking about, which is what happens when you're telling everyone to stay home, right? Um, so the VA is moving like many other hospital systems. They're trying to move to as much telework as possible. And, you know, staff are complaining there's not enough telework. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people are being asked to defer their regular medical appointments. So I think that we definitely, uh, it's a good question to ask the VA. Veterans who usually show up for, you know, group therapy sessions uh, for their PTSD, uh, veterans who show up for treatment uh, for uh, any mental health condition. Um, uh, what is happening there now? You know, what kind of social work is being carried out uh, when we're all so socially distanced? And is this like really important service, is it not being performed? And this goes also to, I mean, one of the questions that my editor had me raise is uh, in, in a recent story is, you know, the VA and other hospital systems are telling everyone to stay home and put off any care that you possibly can, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody's going to the dentist right now, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are veterans who have conditions where putting that off is gonna have a really negative impact on them later. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's reasonable as reporters to be asking those questions. And the question about domestic violence and social work is then just part of the suite Mm -hmm. of services that may or may not be provided that we're accustomed to being provided because of the conditions that we're now in. Um, so we have uh, one question from uh, Alia Utianova, Utiova, um, and then I'll have one more after that, and then we'll, we'll call it an afternoon. Um, Alia's question is, could you talk about insurance companies more? Are they projected to make or lose profit are the companies like Cigna who waived customer cost sharing likely to be eligible for a bailout, an incentive? What do you think is going on in the health insurance market? Um, well, this is, this is not my area of expertise, but I will say that uh, another reporter at uh, Reveal is currently working on the issue of people making claims for COVID-19 and being denied. A mm -hmm. lot of insurance companies have exclusions for pandemic which we probably didn't think when we got our health insurance to- Yikes. <laughs> you know? Uh, and then also uh, uh, there is in the bailout, um, other people have written about the candy cane. Like, I, you know, in my story on the bailout, I talked about a $170 billion uh, sweetener for the real estate industry that's gonna personally benefit Donald Trump and Jared Kushner by allowing them to calculate their taxes on their holdings differently. The same is true for the healthcare industry. They are facing some legitimate pain with everyone rushing to the, you know, to the, to the hospital right now, all of us using our insurance at the same time, right? And so insurance is about shared risk. So there's a bailout for them that maybe we could all agree on as necessary. But then there's also a candy caning of other things. And that is definitely a good area for further investigation. So uh, as a final question, let me ask you this. We've got, I don't know, something like 80 reporters on this call. Um, if, if you were to imagine a kind of national or global informal conspiracy of journalists to chip away at, at one or two important questions um, going forward, both bearing in mind your, your, your recommendation to kind of live in the present, but also asking what's going to get worse. What's the story that you would love to see a bunch of reporters in different places chipping away at so we all get a hold of it? You know, I think that, um, the, I think that the economy is a story uh, where this local, national, uh, uh, virtual circle is, is going to be very important. You know, what I was describing before about how the only way you know how much relief you get is by knowing if the federal government owns your loan or your landlord's loan, mm -hmm. right? That is just one example of, of the really Kafka-esque uh, 
place that so many Americans are going to be finding themselves in, in the very, you know, like right now and in the coming months. I mean, we know that, I mean, I interviewed a Trump administration official yesterday who said he thinks the economy is about to snap back as soon as we beat the pandemic. I don't know how many people believe that. So if we're heading into a situation where the unemployment rate is going to go way up and a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money and there's going to be a lot of shared pain, reporting on who wins and who loses in that kind of environment and whether or not the systems are set up in such a way where people can get relief mm -hmm. is, I think, going to be a main thing. Well, and thank I, yeah. yeah. And I do think the VA is another issue. You know, that's one reason why I had not been reporting on it for a while, but I went back in it. And you see a lot of interest on this call because it is America's largest healthcare system. And uh, the VA in Washington does prefer not to share too much information. But you can go to all the hospitals, you know, you talk to yeah. veterans where they're at and triangulate that up to the top. Yeah. So before we go, I would like everyone who's on the call to please turn on your cameras so we can uh, memorialize this with a screenshot, uh, get a picture of us all together as a gigantic global virtual newsroom. Looking good, folks. <laughs> Come on, keep it going. More, 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 more. One or two, come on, keep it going. Uh, smile and say, muckraker. <laughs> um, thank you, Aaron, for a really rich uh, 45 minutes of conversation. Thank you all for being here. We're going to take a break this Thursday just to kind of slow down, catch our breath. Then we'll be back on Tuesday with an important conversation that uh, not enough journalists are having right now with uh, uh, about how to cover death in this pandemic. We'll be talking with Ari Goldman, professor of journalism here at Columbia, who has made covering death, reporting on death, not only obituaries, but the whole question central to his own work and expertise. Um, and this is something we're, we got to get our minds around as indeed colleagues in many parts of the world already have. So I'm looking forward to a rich conversation on that. And then Thursday, uh, Kate McMahon, the director of DART Center Asia Pacific, will lead us through a conversation about resilience and self-care in the course of this pandemic and all the strange things that it's brought with us. Um, so thank you all. Thanks, Susan Kaplan, for uh, doing tip sheets and other resources off the back of these. Thank you to my colleagues, uh, Ariel Richen and Kate Black, who have been driving the car while I've been yakking away to Aaron. Um, and thanks to my uh, friends at Columbia Journalism Review, who also have sponsored, pushed out, made this thing happen. Um, see you next week, folks. Thanks a lot.